Hi everyone and welcome to the seventh art design in conversation. Uh, my name is Sandeep. Uh, I'm the founder and starter of uh, this organization that you see on your screen right now, Bhuvneshwar Experimental Art and Design Studio. Uh, uh, the acronym is BEADS. We've been uh, uh, we started in 2022, uh, 2022 during the during the times of the COVID. And we are a design studio that is based out of Bhuvneshwar that creates elegant, ethnically inspired and environmentally friendly products. Uh, the idea behind Beats was that we have a firm belief in the power of art and design to make people's lives better. So, um, and we our products are completely handmade. They're contemporary. Uh, we have very strong value systems when it comes to uh, uh, sustainability. So we have eco-conscious packaging. We don't use any plastic in our packaging. And uh, the idea is to get you products, get our customers products that make a difference in their lives and make them feel good about having uh, our products in their, <clears throat> uh, in their lives. Uh, our vision is heavily inspired from our state, which has a lot of creative uh, practices, a lot of creative craft practices. Uh, which we are hoping to revive with uh, with our work, and our vision is to inspire lives with inspiring designs. So what is um, as a part of this, we just not only focused on designing products or making products that look beautiful, are aesthetically nice, and are well designed, but we also want to have conversations with people from the realms of art and design to understand. Uh, their motivations and methodologies uh, and ADC Art Design and Conversation is an attempt towards that. It's a series that has dialogues with uh, accomplished professionals spanning diverse realms of art and design and we seek to unravel the ecological and communal consequences associated with mass manufactured goods um, and then underscore the importance and pertinence of native traditions and how they can play a transformative role uh, in uh, reshaping contemporary perceptions of craftsmanship. Uh, and to walk us through a very important element of design, which is user experience. Uh, our ADC today is titled as uh, The Art of User Experience. Uh, I'm very uh, honored and uh, privileged to have Yukti Anand, the young designer. Welcome to this show, Yukti. Thank you. Um, we'll, yeah, thanks, Yukti. And I'll just give a brief bio uh, of Yukti so that everybody gets to know, but then we'll hear uh, straight from the horse's mouth about everything that's related to user experience and the work that she does. So, Yukti uh, graduated from the Design Village uh, in Noida with a BDES uh, in Interaction Design. Uh, she's worked as an experienced designer with Design Factory India, where she was involved in designing the experience for a gallery uh, in uh, Smithburn Memorial Museum, which talks about disaster mitigation and risk management. Uh, she's also worked on uh, interactive installations in hologram projection mapping in the Red Fort Visitor Center. As a UX researcher, she has also worked on uh, prototyping uh, an app uh, in a UNHCR project uh, around refugee women um, uh, in the Rohingya community. Uh, she's also worked at Lime Tray, which is a restaurant industry focused startup, uh, where she was a senior UX designer designing interfaces solutions for the restaurant management application. Um, and currently, she's uh, uh, engaged at uh, Dassault Systems uh, as a UX design specialist. So, uh, welcome to uh, ADC again, Yukti, and thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us. Um, thank you so much, Lindsay, for the introduction and giving, uh, like, uh, you rightly give the uh, bio, like, offline, yeah. Yeah, it's so variant. You've been in so many different projects, like, you know, there's art, now you're in weapon systems design, I'm assuming, with that saw, or um, you are being, you've worked on apps for uh, refugee women and I've seen some of the portfolio projects that you've worked on. Very diverse, very potent uh, uh, problems that you've approached. 
So I'm going to just ask a very basic question. How did you get into the world of design? A little bit about your journey. What inspired you into getting into um, user interaction design as a UX designer? Just tell us a little bit about how you got into it. How has it been so far? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, like uh, everyone, everybody else, I, when I uh, completed my 12th, I did not know much about design. And, you know, at that time, design was not well known. So there was just a lift that people knew about design. But I was yeah. sure that I wanted to do design, but right. not fashion design. So right. I took a year off just to understand more possibilities. So while researching, you know, I just knew that there is more to it since I wanted right. to do something more than just yep. uh, uh, you know, fashion design. So when right. I joined coaching, I explored design. Right. Where you can apply. Um, after giving exams of different colleges i did got into in NIFT and mit but i chose design village because they were more different they talk so their thought process about design was aligned with mine so right. i decided to join them um okay which came out to be a very good decision because right. again uh, they were not someone who were just talking about uh you know elements of design and right. you know they were talking beyond which is like design thinking and right. they so there uh i got a chance uh so you know an eye opener which is like critically questioning everything you see so not just accepting whatever is being asked but more like how can how why are if there is a problem then why is the problem or if a client gives us a problem statement then asking the question why and getting to the roots of it is most important so um so these things so uh why i got into design was my curiosity of uh, you know why of the fashion why not something else as well why not something using design for other uh, areas like adventures at that point of time i wanted to do something in adventures but eventually right. uh, the journey took me into a different aspect right and were there any designers that uh you used to follow back in the day or that inspire you even today that you feel like okay that's the kind of work i want to do that's the kind of work i want to put out there um, so there is uh, actually one whom I haven't personally met, but who is right. Don Norman. And uh, so yeah. he has written a book, uh, Design yeah. of Everything Things. And when you read yeah. that book, you understand that uh, how design is there in very little things, which yeah. we Brilliant. Uh, realize that it could be there. Yeah. So I, and he also mentions one fact that, you know, understand. Spend ninety percent of your time understanding the problem, and not right. the solution, which was not the case earlier. So, he talked very fundamentally what is going wrong in the process. So yeah. he sort of inspires me in the kind of uh, books he has written, the kind of understanding he has gained. I would like to have same kind of understanding, and you know, right. to be able to give valuable experiences products out there right and i think uh we we actually have that book and uh uh i think one of the first times when i read that book it was just so inspiring to see the kind of perspective he brings to things about those little things that make a huge difference uh to uh to user interaction and you know human-centered design as he keeps talking about uh and i think that's uh it's a magnificent book. I would re recommend anybody who's on this call to actually have a, a read of Don Norman because he's just phenomenal. Um, and everything he's talked about is just brilliant. Um, and for the uninitiated, like a bunch of us here, what does a UX designer do? Like, give us some, give us an idea of like what's a day in the life of a UX designer such as yourself now that you. Had such a varied experience in your portfolio. 
Um, so, uh, okay, so I'll tell first what is the aim of a UX designer and then yeah. maybe I can talk about the misconception that people think that UX designers. So, the aim of a UX designer is, and if I talk in terms of designing a product, in terms of a digital product, uh, the aim is to make the product usable right. without you being there. And okay. to be able to do that, you need to uh, understand the user and their scenarios. Right. Uh, you need to understand, you need to design the workflows. So, mm -hmm. so let's say if I give you an example, like let's say I am designing an app for the, mm -hmm. for ordering food. Now, to be able to, for the user to order the food uh, easily. Right the workflow has to be designed as well mm -hmm. and along with the workflow then comes the interface user interface right and to be able to design the workflow and the user interface you need to know the user you need to empathize right. the user like what do they want like for example right. how why is the filter which or non which important right so when so we have different tools to understand the user mm -hmm. and the scenarios, you know, to design right. a better product. And uh, so we do mm -hmm. these empathy mapping, we design these persona. So persona is basically uh, a generalized uh, caricature of our, uh, uh, of our users, listing down right. their characteristics, what is their goal and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so likewise you need to have a good knowledge of human psychology so that to analyze right. how they would behave when they get on yeah. an app and and these tools that you are referring to are they like surveys or focus groups from which you kind of derive the information or uh are, is it more generic than that like what kind of tools are we talking about here Okay, so um, the ideal UX designer would be someone who empathizes with the user's will. So okay. UX design is basically a progressive uh, design. So, you know, you will always do research even after your product is built. So okay. the service and the focus group is more like the tools, the research tool to gather the information but right. then what you do with those information are basically you make the scenario mappings you make the user personas and right. so that you have in one uh bucket uh, the overall picture of what who is our user right. so these tools exist just to understand the user better and so right. what i'm trying to emphasize is that how much important is it to understand our user before that designing for them is might take a wrong toll on the product right I'll, so and i think it's a very important point to make by saying that even after the product is built you keep doing the research you keep like seeking feedback but um when do you draw the line saying that i have enough data that gives me enough information about you know the different customer journeys, the different customer personas that are there. Uh, at what time, or is it an instinct, or is there a method to this madness of deciding? Okay, I've been not to design a product uh, that hits all the key points that our users looking for. Um. So, like I said, that uh, it is a progressive um, process to be able to right. design. So once, so there is like. Um, you sort of compromise on what you need for the first phase. So, you know, there are versions right. of products. So for this version, maybe I will cater to this uh, part mm. and yeah. I will be okay with this enhancement because it can go, it can go on. Uh, right. And therefore it, before even when you gather a lot of information and you see the possibilities, you, mm make your decision uh, mm -hmm. discussing with the owners or CEOs like what would be our version one right right 
because otherwise it can it may not ever be built because we might be yeah. able to get the perfect product um yeah. so what that also does is that you get a chance to test um right. if this works well or that works well yeah uh, do, making it in different versions yeah because i think uh, we also as we have, we have we create products at our studio and we're working on it we always have this challenge of understanding at what point of time do we go through that circle of ideating and prototyping and ideating and prototyping till okay i think it's time to launch the product i mean that's always a challenge that i think uh, uh we've we uh, grappled with uh but there is either there's a commercial challenge or there is like a you know financial restriction which kind of prompts it okay stop ideating i think we have been up a lot are there any like tips or thoughts you have on this like when you think the endless prototyping cycle should be broken because you want to create the perfect product there's nothing like the perfect um yeah so uh, again then you need to go back to the goal you right. know and what is the perf- the primary function of your product digital right. product so let's mm-hmm. say if my primary function of the digital product is to be able to order food on the app so then it should leverage uh, very general scenarios maybe mm-hmm. not very specific scenarios let's let's say the mvp which is the minimum viable product should be able to let the user order the food like right. there should be one workflow that has to be completed right and there should be no um, you know obstacles that should come Right. for that one workflow so that's how you can decide that if we have perfectly catered one use case or one workflow which is like i to be able to order the food right. then maybe for the version 1 it mm-hmm. is catered right and and the next version maybe you can look into another enhancements maybe when you research you find out that people also would like to know which are the which food and i don't want to order any non veg food because that make me feel disgusted about looking mm. at the food and that's when where you come up with another enhancement and that you decide okay let's do like let's give a filter and people right. in the next user flow people should be able to easily filter the menu items based on veg items um right. so likewise there are multiple enhancements which can be researched on and these enhancements also hold right how much user it is going to impact mm-hmm. so yeah. if it is something very small maybe somebody maybe some text which is not visible which is not even that important maybe that enhancement can be catered later right. but something which is going to cater to a large audience right that has to be catered more because again it is about again making the product usable for a larger audience so right. that's how you can decide yeah i think i think it's a very important point you make saying that when you are coming to that end pass you go back and look at the main user case so um what was the reason you brought down the journey of creating this product and uh, helps uh, helps clarify uh scope and also the versioning that you've just referred to and um i think it's a challenge we all grapple with but i think this this is a very important point you make and i think from your perspective what you've already highlighted one of the qualities of a good ux designer but what should be the qualities of a good ux designer from what you've seen so far what should they be watching out for uh during the journey like what are the three or four things you would say a really key to become a good ux designer um a good ux designer should be able to like i said since our users we are designing for our users okay. so he will he or she will make uh our best like their best effort to right. understand, uh, understand those better within a different time frame you know within a limited yeah. time frame because time yeah. frame is to be uh, catered because it cannot like i said it cannot go endlessly right um and the more tools you use the more effort you use to understand the problem right. you're solving 
that is also a very good um, quality of a good designer ux right. designer like ton normal sand understand the problem first and then design the solution right um another big uh, important quality is sometimes when we make designs uh, we get very um, you know protective of our designs of our right. concepts yeah in that case um i think we should not take our designs personally and we should be receptive of feedback critical right. uh, feedbacks yeah um so the ability to look at the feedback as not something you know which is rejecting your design but right. uh, to be able to see it as okay yeah, this yeah. might not be working right um and i think uh majorly these are uh, you um you also refer to uh, psychology uh, which i thought was quite interesting uh, where where in the process of designing a product or an intervention uh, do you uh, do you kind of delve into the psychological aspects of this yeah so um you know so sometimes like i said that uh, you know there are some misconceptions about what ux designer do right. which is like making things beautiful yep mm-hmm. but again it's not that mm-hmm. it's not just about making things beautiful mm-hmm. there is um there is a flow in the content you look at a web page i'm talking very specifically to yep. just give an example yeah the point is if the hierarchy mm-hmm. of the web page is not correct it won't be usable it will like let's imagine like if when you read a book and the heading and the paragraph is same exactly right. the same mm-hmm. then you won't be able to easily recognize what is the context that you are going to read so right. there there to be able to no for so designing the hierarchy of the web page so that the user understands and read it in the correct way right you need to have knowledge of how the user is going to perceive and behave right okay and uh, for that knowledge you need to have an understanding of uh, how they are going to behave and that is where you need to know human psychology and okay. that how it plays the role of uh, understanding of human psychology while designing these web pages right and is that something that's taught uh, in your courses like in design village or any of the design courses there is a there is a subject on that that you also study yes um it it was a part of uh, uh, our course right. but uh, so the point is when you are designing a very heavily used software which is used by millions of users you know so working with the source systems i am working on a product which is used by mul- like millions of users again a particular kind of engineers and then also are from different countries right. with different languages so um so be, so whatever is being talked there right and to be able to apply for when you start applying uh, these in reality right that that's where you understand it more immersively you know uh-huh. what works and what may what may not work i think uh, applying it is something that can give you more understanding of it So there is a course bit, and then there is the application bit, and the feedback that kind of helps the process. Yes. So, um, considering that we are living in a world today where uh, awareness of different user profiles and different ways in which people interact, for example, uh, for people who are, uh, uh, you know, physically handicapped or who have uh, challenges uh, in um, uh, reading or dyslexia. I mean, there's so many different kinds of users. um so i know you use user personas like you've mentioned but at, do you feel that sometime uh there is a psychological trap of falling into like this is what most people will be doing because obviously you can cannot like specialize for every bit so there is a trap of falling into this own general 
idea of how people will interact or how do you tackle that when there are so many different kinds? Um, that's a good question. So what happens is this is uh, known as design or accessibility. Yeah. I mean, that's one and, example. There can be many yeah. others. I just, I just picked the easiest one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, so, you know, when your product is uh, up to that level, yeah. you know, and you have that kind of user base as well, and you know, there might be users uh, that might be using your product, you know, with certain abilities, different abilities. Right. Um, it is not that people tend to ignore it. Yeah. Like I said, there are versions and you sort of prioritize the workflows. Right. Now imagine you have catered most of the workflows, uh, basic workflows, and then there comes, uh, you know, let's cater for accessible, uh, to, let's cater to workflow which makes our product more accessible to different kind of people. Right. Let's say if a uh, very basic example, let's talk about colorblind. Right. And now the thing with colorblind is that, you know, there are different kind of colorblindness also. Yeah. So taking, so uh, taking those into consideration, um, uh, let's say we figure out a solution, you know, we use colored colors, mm -hmm. but we increase the contrast. Okay. between the background and the text. So that solves the problem for all kinds of color blindness. Right, right. Um, and you know, there is a gray shades, uh, even if you use different colors, but and they, let's say they are looking at it as a different shade of gray right. or green. Mm -hmm. um, but when you play with the right contrast, it still fits good for them, you know, yeah, it works yeah. for them. Now, um, what happens is it does not necessarily mean that if we are making a, a product for, let's say, colorblind people, yep. it cannot be made for the, you know, general users. It is a right. misconception. So right. when you solve problem for the, let's say, people with low vision, you also solve problem for the, you make the product more usable or easier for right. the general public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think this is something that you've been referring to as the progressive nature of design, that you would be designing a product to cater to like a major section, and uh, also trying to bring in as much as you can in terms of key design features around accessibility and understanding your audience. But there'll always be feedback that you'll have to factor in as you do multiple versions of the product where you get different user experiences in there. I think that's that's what we were referring to, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you think just uh, I, when I read your portfolio, there were so many interesting design interventions that you have worked on. And I know there's some that are confidential and you cannot speak about them in public, like the one around public transport I was just talking to you before the show started. That seemed really interesting. Uh, but is there any one design intervention that you think you can share that kind of talks us through the journey of a UX designer um, and uh, what what was what was interesting and different about it? And uh, most of you, you can share your screen also. If you want. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so I may be uh, talking about a, com a project which was a part of a competition, international competition. Yeah. Um, so I picked this uh, project because I wanted to use design to be able to cater to some problem which is not usually catered by design, which was world hunger. Okay. Um, Very cool. I'm sharing uh, my screen. Give me a minute. Sure. So, like I said that, I wanted to use design for something very unusual. Uh, like I said, that's what kept me in design from the starting, right? right. Um, so, this was a competition which wanted to uh, find a solution for world hunger. And we went on with, uh, you know, choosing our target audience. So, there was a whole lot of process. Right. Uh, but uh, I'll go ahead with 
whom did we choose to intervene so we chose um uh, rohingya refugees okay um because i have a experience in working with them in the past so so that's why we chose it um so my journey started you know knowing there again like i said it's very important to know the scenario you know right. mm-hmm. uh the context we are dealing with so we went me and my team uh mayank and manisha we three together used to travel to the refugee camps in delhi based okay. in delhi and we used to go and have casual talks we used to observe what is around them what are, what are their living conditions what are their problems we used to go through research papers uh articles news and articles so just to get a hack of uh you know what's happening with them in delhi why they are in delhi how come they are a, uh, in india so refugee uh so rohingyas uh were basically an ethnic minority ethnic group in myanmar they were persecuted and then they had to go to bangladesh which is the major uh camp where they are residing and part of them also flew to india because it's very nearby you know so yeah. myanmar they mm-hmm. flew from myanmar um so what is their life here so you know they being refugees um they don't have in there is not a signatory to you know un convention laws which was given by united nations so these refugees don't have right to uh you know work no right education and so basically they do they are totally dependent on unhcr so just okay. big big uh bit of background unhcr is uh an organization by united nations um mm-hmm. and they take care of all these refugees uh you know to provide them basic ration basic shelter and not very lavish ones but you know yep. generally just helping them survive right um so the ration they gave is basically a pot of rice and some uh pulses and oil okay so open just just basic and for the shelter they give this bamboo sticks and uh you know plastic sheets uh to be able yep. to fight Yep. Um they don't have an Aadhaar card so they can't go to you know for some basic things like bank accounts and stuff. Right. So even if they are somehow you know trying to find in a corporate job they can't because to be able to apply for a job in a corporate you need to have a bank account for PF uh, you know corporate stuff. Right. So they end up going in this I hand formal sectors. job and uh, uh not really so their future is uncertain because okay. um you know their kids can have a proper job that is certain but uh, they don't know what is what are they going to do in future being yeah, in yeah. india or if they are ever going back to myanmar or their homeland will they ever sit on um, so giving the gist of that so what we next understanding everything every aspect about them we took a small area you know you yep. is which was uh, in shambihar in delhi you know mm-hmm. so where they were actually designing some 20 families i guess right. and uh, so there uh, they were living in shanties again and their living condition was horrible okay so they were living next to um a dump or medical waste so what you see here the blue uh markings are basically their medical waste is dump you know okay and yeah. which is dangerous in itself so yep. um the water quality was also bad so we actually went to this place we actually saw these uh conditions living conditions we actually calculated the water quality mm-hmm. we calculated yep. the tds you know what okay. are water sources so so since we were dealing with hunger we were trying to understand uh you know many aspects of nutrition yeah 
you know, and we also try to, and living conditions obviously cater to water, always mm-hmm. cater to the nutrition in the body, right? right. Um, we also try to talk to our doctors that, you know, what is that? So they, even doctor comes on that their immunity is very low because, you know, when the weather changes, they catch up the cold very easily. Okay. So it, it was a sign of uh, low immunity. Their eyes were yellow because that is a sign of weakness. Right. So um, we also observed one behavior was after talking to them that you know they used to sell a part of their ration right. uh, to right. be able to buy um, only to buy fish. You know, so they buy okay. these dried fish uh, and then have it because. You know, imagine having rice and pulses every day of your life. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That is, and that is why they end up selling a part of their ration um, to be able to, to to be able to buy their culturally desired food. Right. Um. After gathering understanding the context, their living conditions, their scenarios, the all the limitations, you know, from. Like there were no, again, I just wanted to clarify, there were no judgments if um, if India did the right thing of not signing is or if there, but there was, it was just more an effort to understand their situation, current situation. Yeah, um, then we try to look at, you know, how different aspects, um, their, what different aspects uh, is basically affecting their well-being so yeah. you know living conditions food and nutrients so their nutrition source was just three and traditionally they used to have these so yeah. um you know so fish was something which was their culturally desired food they mm-hmm. were going living conditions we all know like like i just showed you livelihood yeah. all in formal sectors so they were also going through depression because you know lost family members they have no idea where so while they were getting persecuted and they were running away yeah you know uh, so a lot of their family members got missing and they have no idea where they are so um so there is uh, no so they were going through depression in formal sector their future was uncertain and the nutrition was they were not getting enough nutrition if i talk about nutrition since um us uh, if we are catering to hunger it's not just about filler foods you know yeah 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 like i can give them biscuit and that can be done but that's not about it uh catering to world hunger means that if you provide enough nutrition you know yeah it's not just about a filler food so and that is why we also looked into the nutritional aspect of it so um what looking at these aspects and what we can do it uh, in terms of that can affect all of this in a positive way yeah we came to the fact that maybe we can help them um uh grow their own food and not okay. just any food but their culturally desired food which was yep. rich. So we propose a system, uh, you know, a DIY system. Uh, okay. So so they are very good with bamboos. Mm-hmm. Um, so in Myanmar, they used to build their houses out of bamboos. So using their uh, existing skills, which was working with bamboos and shelters, they can make their tanks mm-hmm. and of uh, aquaculture and then they can grow the species, you know. Okay. So even for the UNHCR, which is a burden of providing food Understood. every month, if if UNHCR can help them setting up this, you know, with the raw materials, um, that that can uh, put down a burden on UNHCR after yep. some time. Yep. So overall, you know, it caters to their self worth and self identity. They 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 can have their own culturally desired food. Yep. And uh, like it sort of uh, in the long run, it can help them cater to their um, nutrition aspect as well. Yeah, this is brilliant actually. I mean, uh, from 
everything that you've just outlined, the aspect of hunger and the importance of food uh, in a person's life, uh, looking at it contextually, not only in terms of their traditional nutrition, but also their skills and all of that. It's brilliant. It kind of hits a lot of the important points that you're talking about. Thank you, Jeff. So what happened with the project? I mean, this recommendation, where where is it right now and uh, how was it received? Um, so, uh, it's like happy to uh, tell that we won uh, the competition. Brilliant. The first prize. Uh, and I see, so currently we are looking for, you know, clients that can help actually implement this project. Right. Um, because initially, like I said, the effort was done to not just win any competition, but also to be able to make, to use design to, yeah. use, to solve a problem like this. Um, we are looking forward to implement it and to see if it actually solves the problem, which we believe it will. Right. Um, so right now we are in the process of uh, getting it implemented and okay. finding that. Yeah. And how was, so when you went through this process, obviously you spent a lot of time with the community, understanding their challenges and all that. How was this intervention received, uh, the idea and the process by the um, by the refugees themselves? Were they receptive, were there resistance? How was that process? Um, so like, like I said, like, uh, there are a lot of challenges. It's yeah. not easy because uh, Okay, so Rohingya refugees are not really perceived well in okay. it or you know anywhere else. Like they were considered threat. Right. Um, so there are multiple political challenges and other challenges. You know, spatial requirements and everything. Um, mm -hmm. Even socially, there are challenges. Um, so it's not easy. Uh, you know, but again just because it's not easy we are not stepping back from implementing it and rather finding uh, more realistic uh, solutions right um but uh, how it is perceived by rohingyas so they yeah. discussed about you know so they were more concerned uh they feel that it's not really uh so uh, okay so they put forward their concerns like you know right. their political challenges Mm -hmm. uh, is how they perceived, which we know and which we know that we have to cater. Mm -hmm. But I think to be able to cater it, we first need to have a particular context, you know, right. where we are going to look into it and what kind of specific political challenges will be there to be able to cater it. Political challenges aside, uh, did you find that they were also enthused about this idea as something that's different and something that can make a difference to their lives? Um, so, it was not a very big conversation yet with them. Uh, right. Like, we are still in the process because uh, getting to connect with them is difficult, you know. Right. Uh, because there is this community leaders, without them, you cannot talk to any one of them. So, there are the multiple challenges to even talk to these people. Right. You need to build that kind of connection. Trust and yeah. Yeah, because they're already very, uh, you know, they're very uh, protective. Yeah, yeah, protective also, you know, because yeah. they, they fear that, you know, um, who might go and say something in media. So these are the fears they have. And that yeah. is why they are quite protective. They don't uh, open up very easily. So um, we have a limit, limited time with them. Uh, yeah. Is not the little trust we have built with them, but yeah. because we went there multiple times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, like I said, uh, it will be more uh, helpful if we get an actual scenario, if we get an actual client who can help us implement this, and then uh, it will be more like uh, we will be able to get more clarity on what exact challenges will be there or right. we can cater, cater, to those, cater to those. Brilliant. I think thanks so much Yuki for sharing this because you know uh, it's such a creative 
add a thoughtful solution to a problem uh, for a community that is so traumatized and uh, obviously facing challenges. And uh, what you have illustrated with this is uh, problem solving is the key bit uh, when it comes to looking at design as a you know, method to solve uh, issues and it's not just about a software, it's not about a product, it's about an intervention that can really make a fundamental difference to people and I think it's this is a really good story that and I really hope you get a client and help you out with this because that would really be the icing on the cake for you for this project that you've worked on. Um, thanks again for sharing that. Any lessons that you drew on this that you still use in your work? Because obviously this is something that's ongoing but what was the one thing you would look back and say that's something I'm going to, uh, you know, use in my work in the future. Um, so I think uh, there are different kinds of learning, you know, there are many small, small learnings, you know, how, so starting from how to build trust, how important it is to build trust when you are talking to your users, let's say. Yes. For example, um, because, you know, uh, there are, so when we used to talk, there are some, at times, uh, you kind of know that they are not truly being honest with you. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the learning was how to build that kind of trust that they open up with you with the true, true concerns, you know. And that is something that helped me in my professional life, like how currently even when I do user uh, research or user interviews, right. I know how to comfort them even when we are meeting for the first time. You know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one of the learning was this. Another learning was again like the process. Uh, yeah. How can we, uh, you know? Uh, so okay. So looking at all the aspects and looking, combining, uh, like uh, looking at some of the larger perspective was something I did here uh, yeah. uh, more deeply, you can say. Yeah, so, uh, the context. That, yeah, the context and everything. So, uh, one of the learning, it was more kind of like, uh, you know, uh, that convinces me more to do that off quite often is to go back to the users and talk to them. Like, uh, sometimes we feel that, okay, it, it might not be required. Yeah, but yeah. this project is another proof for me, kind of like a reminder for me. No, that is, when you yeah. know that, it it becomes completely different thing. So yeah, that's yeah. such a yeah. I mean, just taking a user for granted for any product or intervention. Uh, I mean, I don't think any good designer does it, but just doing something like this underscores the importance of it even more. I think that's that's such a valuable lesson. Yeah, I, so, yeah. Yeah, and then so you can just just going back to something you said earlier. When you started off, you were not sure about what is design, and it's all about fashion design, and uh, and then you explored uh, uh, design as a as a subject and graduated in in it. Uh, have you seen the change? I mean, it's symptomatic of so many people not really understanding what what design and what does a designer do. Have you seen a change? in this perception of design, its importance in the creation of, you know, better lives and better systems. And what's your thought on the prospective of growth of, the, of uh, design as an important element in India since the years that you have studied and worked? Um, so definitely design is getting more known, you know, than before. Like uh, how at that point of time, you know, when I uh, passed yeah. on my secondary high, which was 12. I didn't knew much about design, but I think now, since people are getting more and more into design, yeah, um, and there is also another design thinking, like yeah. isn't it, which is very important, like critically questioning everything you see, or it's not so how we are taught in school just to accept what you're uh, like teacher says simply yeah yeah but uh, it's not you know really learning it's it's like wasting your uh, some 12 years on something yeah. that you don't really understand 
even our this indian education is understanding you know right. when you when you actually teach somebody something you know and when they critically question and when they truly understand yep. and uh, that is why they have introduced design thinking methodology as a subject right. in school six standards onward okay so it's very um, so i think yes india will be going ahead in many fields um i know for say like um uh, you know design is also going to be there in uh health yeah. like health products you know so there is uh, one uh designer uh they basically designed a mri machine for kids okay and it was not just functional but you know kind of giving that emotions yeah. you know that kid will enjoy doing the yeah. mri and yeah. it's like using uh, kid kid see visual clouds and this animation is going on brilliant um so you know so it's not stopping and uh, the, there are more organization comings which are yeah. using this design thinking methodologies there are more books coming in even and it is getting introduced in our uh, schools which yeah. will make it more of evident choice if if anybody wants to pursue it uh, they will be having more context yeah and i think given the options to study in colleges is is growing and there are more there's more awareness around this uh there's so many design festivals that are also happening uh, yeah. where the community gets together so i think all of that uh kind of underscores that you know it design talks about that larger context in which we are all living our impact on the environment our impact on other people and all of that kind of gets uh, uh centralized when you start thinking about it from a designer's viewpoint which I think is really really good. What is your advice to young people uh of or students of any age that you see you want to get into design or what interested in this of maybe up listening to this conversation and that excellent case study you shared what would be the one thing you would say uh of two things you would say to students or young people who want to get into it how do they how do they um dive into this world Um so I would suggest one thing which I learned very fundamentally in TDD like the design village right. um is to critically question things um you know so that will be painful I think because okay. it was painful for me to you know question and it took effort to understand you know right why because sometimes it gets very heavy you know you don't know where to stop asking the why yeah um but I think even though if it will be p- painful uh once you start questioning things you will start understanding things better right. and or if if you understand things better you will also know where can you innovate right um so when you start uh, for example if you start questioning that you know there is a like this is a pencil so why is the shape like this you know can it be something different and when you start exploring you know make something different try to use some different material maybe something experimental so you know you will try to you will find some challenges you know maybe right. the rubber pencil does not really work or something you know the pencil which can be bendable might not really work or maybe that can work very well so you know um when you start questioning different aspects of things you start understanding them better right and I'll- you also know that you know maybe this can help me in this kind of a situation like a bendable pencil can help me you know some for a different target user straight pencil can help a, a different target user so um it's very important uh, i think this is one of the advice i would give uh, so even uh, when the client come up with the but also also uh, one more thing that to be able to design within the limitations is also right. an art i would say yeah yeah um, such an important point yeah um because at the end we have to realize that it has to be implemented and it's not just something we just thought of Yeah. all the design board and yeah 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 i think those are very important points that we should critically question um 
everything that we often take for granted because uh and that's sort of encouraged like you're saying in our education system or even in our social conditioning but uh just doing that uh is itself for uh, the first steps towards reimagining problems and reimagining solutions i believe so i think that's a very very important point and yukti thank you so much for walking us through your journey and all these uh beautiful um points that you've just made uh, and on the on the on the question of questions i'd like to open it to the group out here if you have any questions for yukti after this amazing presentation if you want to ask her then i think i'm sure we can take a couple of questions so while people are thinking through i just want to ask you one question which i've always been asking to everybody artificial intelligence what do you think it's going to do to design um i think it is just going to support uh, yeah. it is not going to take any jobs i think yeah uh, but it is just okay so it's like a tool i think um, okay uh, like how we use photoshop right. to design our graphics but that does not mean that you know it is going to take away the jobs i don't think so i think it's just a tool uh, not not in terms of just a tool it does not does anything but you know it is going to support a lot yep. of uh, workflows again uh, yep. a lot of pro- business processes um but uh, And yeah, it is I mean, still getting explored. Yeah, every time something new comes out, either we underestimate it or overestimate it. Uh, and so every time we have these discussions, they'll be like, "Ha, yeh to rahega." I don't think much is going to change. But uh, from every conversation on AI, it seems to have this power that uh, can fundamentally alter the way even the way we are perceiving things, the way we are and working with things. So um do you think that if we take the job part aside do you think that fundamentally you would have uh, AI designing a product for people without any human intervention at all Um no <laughs> Shock uh, uh, even to yeah uh, okay so AI will help me or will help any designer for sure let's say a product but um he, to be able to like i said uh, they still will lack some capabilities that human has human has emotions human has predictability and predictability uh, the ability to understand a particular situation the ability to react the ability to sense uh, beyond facts you know yeah yeah uh so sometimes human skin sense the vibe let's say if the ai is going to uh for a research you know for a survey or a focus group discussion they yeah. won't be able to let's say there is an entire human going yeah. to focus group discussions yet they won't be able to you know um get the sense to the level a human can human yeah. is uh, so we are talking about humans you know which are very complex themselves you know we as a nature human beings are very complex with thousands of nervous system brain is complex and so um i don't think so but you know it will be easy and uh, designing uh making something AI can definitely help in things which have standards. Right. But when it comes to uh even in terms of exploring it can help, you know, find things out. Yeah. But when it comes to understanding the emotions and because since I like I said designing involves that layer. Right. right. And therefore when you need to design for an emotions which is you know the new trend for products yeah human centered yeah then uh, it's not just about functionality anymore ai can do because functionality is involving standards ai can do that but uh, when it comes to emotions human will be better to do that yeah. 
and if somebody is already we are having resources who can do it better why to create ai for that so we'll hold you to that prediction and revisit it in 10 years to see if it's going to be any different and uh maybe um it'll be a brave new world out there um any questions from the audience when we have you here or she has just answered all the questions you ever had on interaction design Uh, hi, Yuki. Okay, thank you for the beautiful session. And we already had a lot of talk about design and all. But uh, for now, I only uh, have one thing in my mind. Uh, in in terms of a uh, product, you can say physical product. Can you suggest uh, uh, I mean design motivation that will be the usability of the product, so it's better ergonomics or more intuitive intuitive controls. Anyway, um, so in terms of the process, like I said, uh, it's not just about for now. At least now, uh, people are not just selling products. You know, people are selling experiences, and uh, while they are selling for experiences, they caters to emotions. You know, so they design the product. for emotions so what that products makes uh the the let's say the user feel let's say if i'm i'm designing a bowl the shape of the bowl has a different kind of ergonomics you get the shape can be different and let's say a bubbly shape and if i'm holding it like this it will make me feel different you know and uh, even the way how i hold it change the experience of the product so and ergonomics can still exist there but again i change the experience ergonomics can also exist you know where while i give the handle and i am holding the bowl in a very different way so with it's not uh, so ergonomics is again like a parameter that needs to be catered but you are again designing the product for emotions and to give a certain experience so basically you are giving designing an experience and while designing that you give a form to it and that becomes your product definitely thank you thank you brilliant. brilliant thanks so much yukti i think that was a brilliant answer and uh, it was an amazing session learning about all the stuff um that designers get to do and the kind of interventions and the perspective that you bring to creative problem solving uh, it's been a true inspiration listening to you and i wish you the very best in everything you want to do and hopefully you get that client that you're looking for that'd be a truly amazing story if you can share with us and thanks so much for being with us on adc uh, thank you thank you so much sandeep thank you so much everyone for having me here brilliant thanks guys and we back uh, in another month with another version of ADC uh talking to uh, uh a designer or an artist or maybe a panel like Abhijit and I were talking about the other day so look forward to seeing you all in the next session thank you everyone